The essence of all of Kubrick films are looking at human frailty, at human vanity, at the fact that we are that we fancy ourselves to be governed by our um, intellect and knowledge and uh, education and ability to think analytically, which is all very, 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 very good. But when it really matters, we are governed by our emotions. And that's a problem. That's why he was interested in Napoleon. Because Napoleon is a perfect example of a man who is hugely successful, highly intelligent, enormously gifted, has an incredible charisma and he was not able to use all these talents that he had properly when it mattered. It was revenge and envy and vanity that governed him to make the wrong decisions. After the Tsar broke the contract of the continental blockade, he should have looked away. He should have looked away, that would have, but he was not a statesman, you see, that he was not. And that interested Stanley uh, because nothing has changed. And this is the same problem we have today. We may have today very, very powerful people, very clever people who are making mistakes to ruin themselves. And uh, that, that's a problem. That's, that's maybe that's part of humanity. He probably wouldn't exclude himself, you see. <laughs> I, saw a chat, I think it's just brilliant. Yeah, but it's complicated. And as I said uh, just now to, to, to the people in the other room, uh, the problem with Aiswar Chad is that you have to see it twice. And uh, not everybody is willing to do that if he didn't like it the first time. Great artists often do things which are not necessarily instantly accepted. Just think of good Vincent van Gogh who never sold a painting. Yeah, only his brother bought two. So I mean, it, it doesn't, it, it, that's, a diff that's a difficult topic. Uh, I think Aiswar Chad in 50 years will be seen as one of the great masterpieces together with the best films by Ingmar Bergman and, and, and so on. Yeah. You know, I remember, uh, it's wonderful, we watched a Wimbledon uh, match between Boris Becker and John McEnroe, and it was, I forgot who won, but it doesn't matter, and it was very exciting, and he said afterwards, gee whiz, I mean, you know, no film could ever be so exciting. So, you see, there's another side of Kubrick. He loved music, he was a jazz drummer as a young man, he was a fantastic chess player, and uh, so, he was good fun working with him. I'm not saying it was always a walk in the park. Yeah, uh, he was extremely demanding, but he was particularly demanding on himself. So, I worked with him for 30 years. Clearly, uh, yeah, I didn't have to. <laughs> so, um, I, I enjoyed it very much. I miss him, yeah. You can't put that man into one sentence. He was both uh, a very open and listening almost humble person and a dictator. These things go together. It depends what you're talking about. It's so interesting that he was so impressed by, by, by Napoleon and, and his strategic thinking. Well, by Napoleon said, well, I'm, I'm very, very careful. I double check and I triple check, which Stanley loved. But when I made the decision, I'm like a woman in labor. There are people now, young people, they don't know Stanley Kubrick. So for them, it is incredibly important to be introduced through, let's say, a film festival like this one to something they didn't know. Um, and to, to realize that uh, every generation has great artists and those artists serve the next generation. Look, uh, as I just said before, everything I know about the, uh, let's say, 18th and 19th century is from novels and paintings and, and music. I wouldn't know anything about it otherwise. So it's the artist always that the first representative of his time. Before you look up in the history book who, oh yeah, what happened in politics, politicians and all this, it's the artist first.